All right, shalom again. This is Wendem Yadin, Ras Yadinos Tesari, the Line of Jews Society. For more info, check us out at our website, www.lojsociety.org. All right, so we want to touch on the Biru. And the Biru has many different names, first of all. They are, they are, they are kind of a host of... Um, different names that um Nibiru um has. In the Ethiopic is Ereto and Ereto is called um in the English is translated as um as uh wormwood, right? In the Bible in the book of Revelations chapter eight it is called and it's identified as um Worm wood, right? Worm wood. Now it's interesting the worm wood connection, right? There's this worm wood connection with this. It's interesting. Let's see if we can bring this um part up right here. We got some graphics here that we would like to uh share with you. And um now there's a there's an old reggae song. Um, Roots reggae song is called Guiding Star. Um, when I think about this, uh, I think about that particular that particular song right there, Guiding Star. I've I've used it in the next vid and everything like that. But um, let me open this right here. I used it in the next vid. It's a kind of an interesting song, and in a sense, with the knowledge that we know about in the build, if you hear the particular song, uh, Guiding Star, right? Um, Guiding star. What's interesting about it is that it seems to be speak. At first, you might think it's talking about the sun, right? You know, God, Ja, Rastafari as the sun. But then there's a media connection when you understand the whole Nibiru connection with, um, and now that we're speaking on the connection with Moses and what the ancient Egyptians knew, who knew what when. You know, it's obvious that the ancient Egyptians preserved a more ancient record that came out of Ethiopia. You understand? Now, this record also was communicated to the Medeanites. We have that Hebrews in ancient Egypt, which were a particular um, religious denomination. Now, in ancient Egypt, like in this society, we all communicate out of certain similar symbols, you know, how, how symbols are used. Now, how they're interpreted in different religious orders, it differs. Now, what we have right here in ancient Egypt, we can see this whole idea, like even right here, this this idea of a birth within this orb right here, you know what I'm saying, this new birth, right? Um, remember, Israel was, was Jah's son that he called out of Egypt. Now, when we look at it celestially, if we look at it from the heavens and we put up the um, thing on um, on Orion or Orion, and it's said to come from and emanate in a sense, or or its trajectory is coming from the Orion. Now, this is the Egyptian um, perspective of Nibiru and the Orion constellation. We know from the Western European and Greeks, they picture Orion differently. The, the Egyptians seem to picture it more in the Hebraic sense of the sower. Because if you see his hand, it fades off here, and you can see the stars. He's um, sowing the stars right here, and he's carrying a staff, in that sense, like a shepherd, right? So he's He's sowing these stars, and there's a seven stars connection. And we touched on um, Amos, Amos, um, I think Amos five. We're saying, look to the one who 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 um, who makes the seven stars and and Orion. Now, there's one particular planet that's of particular interest, and that is called, uh, some say, the tenth planet. You understand? Know the tenth planet or Nibiru, right? The tenth planet, Nibiru. Previously, we touched on the connection of this, you understand, know with this, the golden calf. And 
we pointed out that previously we had the question of why did not Aaron like get sentenced? You understand um, for idolatry, seeing that he's the one they turned to, and he made this golden calf. And he said to the people, these be thy gods, even though it seems to be a singular image, but he refers to plurally. What is he referring to? Is he referring to the, the different elements, such as the disc, the uraeus, the serpent, the cow, the cow being a calf, a calf being a, a, a child, you understand? Not the mother god is anymore, but not, not the cow but now the child of the cow, which is to say not the mother, but the child of the mother. And Israel being called also a son, and Yah or Jah saying he's called his son out of Egypt. So Moses is up in the mountain, and the people don't know what happened to this Moses, this Musa, this fraternal head of the order of the Hebrews. So they turn to the other the head, you understand, um, the prophet. Remember, Aaron was the prophet and Moses was to be God, Elohim to Pharaoh. And here in verse um, 8, we have um, Aaron saying that, you know, like um, um, he says, uh, I commanded them, they have made a molten calf and worship. Let's back it up a little bit. Let's back it up a little bit because... Um, um, in verse, what is it, verse uh, verse 5. Now, after they, they used the gold, they all had golden earrings. And when Aaron saw it, okay, he built the altar, but before that, go to verse, verse, um, verse uh, right here, verse 4. So when he received the gold at their hand, he fashioned it with a graving tool, after he had made it a molten calf, and they said, so he made it a molten calf, and he fashioned it, like detailed it from the engraving to, he said, these be thy gods, or these thy gods, O Israel, because those parts that are in italics in your Bible don't really appear there in the original Masora or traditional um, Torah but they add it in by the translator to make sense. So if you read it without that, you get more of the crude, the, the, the primitive sense, these thy gods, O Israel, not these be. And they sound black there, right? But these thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. So he's saying that this calf is their gods, which brought them up out of the land of Israel. And when Aaron saw it, or when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow a feast to the Lord. So now he's saying that this calf, this cow be your God, and tomorrow you're going to have a feast to Yahweh. So he's clearly connecting Yahweh, right, or the God of the, the Hebrews, right, with this particular golden calf right here, which brought them up out of uh, out of um, Egypt. But now, if we go to verse 6, going over this again, it says, and they rose up early on the morrow. They were eager now, you know. Now they were, you know, now they were religious, you know. It's like now they were going to church, in other words, and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings, and people sat down to eat, you know. Like after the service, they had a little food and to drink, and they rose up to play. That play needs to be understood more to have an orgy. I know it sounds wild to folks, but you have to understand that at that time, Egyptian religion had, had degenerated. You understand? They no longer understood the symbology. The Hebrews did. You understand? The Medeanites did. But the, the Egyptian, it's like Christianity today. People no longer really understand the true message of Christ. It's, it's quite obvious. You understand, except to the blind. Verse 7 says, And Yahweh said to Musa, Moses, go, go, get thee down, come off the mountain. Our close encounter is for now is done. Go down, right? For thy people, which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted have corrupted themselves. The idea that they've corrupted themselves, they've cheapened themselves, they've devalued 
themselves. But notice that Yahweh, right, he says to Moses, you understand, that it's you that brought them out of the land of Egypt. What did his brother say? His brother said, his brother said, well, this be thy gods which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. And it's, it's, this, it's this cow image. But he said, these be. You understand, these be. In other words, this is the, this is the object. You know, this, is, this is the object symbolized that you are used to. You cannot experience it. You don't want to experience it anymore. You want to objectify the experience. You want to go from a movement now to inertia. That's how inertia happens. You know what I mean? Look at Christianity. They talk all this kind of talk, but look at the world. You know, so look what the real acts of living like Christ you understand? They philosophize and so forth and so on. It's easy to talk, but it's hard or difficult, you know, to, to do, to act on it. It becomes symbolic. I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. I go to church. Look at me at church, so forth and so on. Look, I got a cross on. Look, I got this on. You know what I mean? Look, I look religious. You understand? But doing it, experiencing it. So the difference between idolatry is just deeper than just the images. But Moses... In the pure legislation, the commandment, the ten words, the Decalogue, you understand, sought to, you understand, make that part of the contract. So the people had already went outside of the covenant. They had gone outside of the contractual agreement by this very act. My question is, did not Haron, Aaron himself? And for a while I was like, why? You know, people begin to think, okay, Moses, Aaron, brothers, he let his brother go, you know, because it's his, it's his home, it's his brother. You understand? That would be a logical fallacy. It's logical, but it, it, it's false when you really understand the true, the true story. Because if you look right here in verse 8, it says, they have turned aside quickly. In other words, how, how long were you gone? Not even a month? Maybe a little more than a month? You understand? And already they, they have turned aside quickly out of the way. In other words, if you turn out of the way, what have you gone? You've gone astray. You've gone astray. They turn out of the way which I commanded them, speaking about the commandment, the ten words, the ten articles, right? They have made them, notice it says they, have made them a molten calf and have worshipped it, you know, and have given it great worth. They said this now explains, you know, you know, now it's like what we're used to, you know what I mean, what it's used to, it's like if you go to a, a church, and when you get to the church, they sit down, they're reading and studying, you know, and teaching, most folks, especially in black church, you wouldn't know that, that would be strange, you understand, where's the singing, where's the hooping, where's the hollering, where's the music, so forth and so on, that's not what we're used to, so in a sense, what happened here? was that Moses was trying to say, we've got to study, we've got to learn this and experience it. And the people, after he wasn't there for a while, they said, give us something we're familiar with. So Mo, what Moses did was did like a mega ch I mean, what, 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 what Aaron did here was like a mega church. This is like your mega church. This is like your prosperity religion. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and they got it. And they sacrificed there too. And they said, these thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt, which have brought thee up. Remember, John says, Moses, you brought them up. And the people and Aaron saying that this is, is it. Could it be that in a sense they are both correct? You understand, in the words, one is symbolic, the golden calf in that sense, as we have here, the golden calf on this level is symbolic of what happened on this level. You understand? What happened on that level. You, you notice the horns, the horns, right? As we look at as we look at face. And we look at the face. They need to see the face of their God. If you understand, they need to see the face of their God. And Yahweh said to Moses, I have seen this people and behold, look, it a stiff necked people. You understand, a stiff necked people. And who are the stiffest necked people on the face of the whole earth? It's not niggas, blacks, and coloreds. Come on now. Be honest. Now, therefore, let me alone. Leave me alone. Yah said, Leave me alone. 
that my wrath may wax hot against them, and that I may consume them, and I will make of thee a great nation. In other words, we're made of Moses. Isn't this interesting? So in a sense, even right here, this Ethiopian Hebrew or Hebrew Ethiopian idea, this Israel Ethiopia idea was in the heart and the mind of the Almighty. How do we know this? Because Moses, a Hebrew, a Israelite, his wife, a Medeanite, an Ethiopian. So when we read Amos, right, and we get further in Amos, Amos 9 and 7, and it says, Aren't you like the children of the Ethiopians unto me, O children of Israel? Or we read Joel chapter 3, where it says that the children of Judah, you know what I'm saying, will sell the Gentiles to the children of the Sabians, who are the Ethiopians, and we are the Judahites, so-called African-Americans. You know what I mean? See that connection there. So here Yahweh is first showing it. He said, get out of my way. Let me consume them. Let me done them. Let me done these disobedient ones, right? And I will make of thee, of you, Moses, you understand, a great nation. You understand, from one man, from one man's family, I will make a great nation. And Moses here, he besought Yahweh, his God, and said, Yahweh, John, why dost thy wrath wax hot against thy people, which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Now, notice this. Now, who brought the children of Israel out, Right? Aaron, he's saying the calf, this this calf symbology did. Yah is saying, Moses, you, this is your people, you brought them out. Now Moses besought, or he praying, he's beseeching and praying Yahweh, you understand, not to exercise his ma'at in the Ethiopic or his wrath against your people, which you brought out. So Moses attributed to Yah. Jah attributes it to Moses. Aaron attributes it to this particular um, symbology that is your work, Tidja uh, Missal. Right? Now, in verse 12, he goes on to say, Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say? Now, now, wait, hold on for a moment. Aren't the Egyptians back in Egypt? You know, like they're on their way. You understand? They're moving forward. They, they've already entered into the wilderness. You know what I mean? They already entered into the wilderness, the badlands. Why in the world is Moses concerned about the Egyptians speaking and saying something? You know what I mean? It must be significant. Even if we don't know why, it must have been significant at the time for him to say this. He says, wherefore, and knows why should the Egyptians speak and say, for mischief did he bring them out? to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth. You understand? So this is kind of interesting right here. Why he's now speaking about the Egyptians in the third hand, speaking about Jah or speaking about himself or one and the same is true. You understand? In other words, the workman and his instrument doing the work is one. Mm -hmm. The workman and the instrument doing the work is one. So he asks this question. He says, turn from thy fierce wrath. So he goes from third person to, to um, second person. Turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. He's saying these are your people. Yah is saying those are your people. So it's, a, it's interesting. He says, remember, now he's invoking the triune the triunity or salase, the, the triunity of God. You know what I'm saying? Remember Abraham, Yisahak, and Israel. Notice he don't say Yaakov here. He says Israel here, thy servants to whom thou swearest, your your bar, your bar. Remember bar is interesting, bar and the Baal connection. To whom thou swearest by thine own self, and said this to them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven. So, uh-oh, here we go. He's going to multiply your seed as what? So, so the, the earthly seed is immediately in the theology of the Israelites is being linked to the stars of heaven, the seed, the race, the, the seed. Your race is as the stars of heaven. 
You understand? As as the stars of heaven. So this too is 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 congruous with where they were, both in Egypt and the Egypts, the upper, the lower Egypt. You understand that he came out and going to the upper Egypt to Tobia, Ethiopia, and then going to the province. You understand? You could almost may call it the suburbs or on a certain level of the Median. You understand? And the Median were another tribe of the ancient Ethiopians connected with the Shabians or the Sabians. You understand? Who were known as 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 stargazers, so-called star worshippers. But basically, they charted the stars. They charted time. You see, all this was about time. It was about calculating time because the stars were very important for farming, for food, for, for everything that was important, for knowing the seasons, when to prepare, for what, so forth and so on. You know, it's, it's not so important today to, to those of us because we rely or deep end on the weathermen. You know what I'm saying? And they're not telling us everything. But he's saying he will multiply your seed as the stars of of heaven and all this land that I have spoken of will I give to your seed and they shall inherit it. Right? They shall inherit it forever. And Yahweh repented of the evil which he thought to do to his people. Interesting. He repented of the evil. Now, does this make Jah evil? No, Jah is just. But he he basically forestalled in a sense, you know, the ultimate punishment for their action. He had mercy on a certain level because of what Moses said. Mercy triumphed above judgment. He sentenced them. He gave the judgment. And then, like, the advocate went before the judge and, and you know, made an appeal. And the judge, it was in the judge's authority and right to relent of that. You understand? Um, and Moses turned and went down from the mount. But Moses had to work this out, you know, in his close encounter. He had to work this out before he came down. And the two tables of testimony, these are two stone tablets which have hieroglyphic, had hieroglyphic engraving. You understand? What's the hieroglyphic written in stone engraving? The two tables of testimony were in his hand. The tables written on both their sides. This is interesting because usually we get this idea that they're written on one side. Here it said that they were written on front and back. On the one side and on the other were they written. And it's interesting when we look at Revelation chapter 5. You know, Revelation chapter 5, and we, 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 we're speaking about the, the, the book, right? We're speaking about the book of the seven seals. You understand? And this is the seal of that particular book. The open book there, the cross, similar to Lala Bella cross, the elliptical orbit of Nibiru, and perhaps the companion star, you understand, the dead star. Because what one, one don't really recognize is that, you know, how the two move. You understand? You know, with the, the, mag, the magnetic gravitational um, um pull of it. Man understands it a little bit and has developed engines that work on that same um, physics, so to speak. But moving forward with this, and the tables were the work of God. Now, the tables were the work of Elohim. You understand? They weren't the work of man. This wasn't the work of man. This is the work of God. Like, And the writing was the writing of God. So this writing was the writing of God. It doesn't say what language it was written, but it's the writing of God. Both God wrote on this, the Elohim wrote on this, you understand, and they were graven. You understand, they were, they were graven, you understand, not images, but they were graven upon tables, upon stone tablets, similar to when we look at hieroglyphic um, writing or engraving. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, a noise of war in the camp, or there is a noise of war in the camp. And he, uh, no doubt, Musa, Moshe said, it is or not the voice of shout for mastery, neither the voice of cry for being overcome. If you add in the italicized, what King James added in, it would read, and he said, it is not the voice of them that shout for mastery, neither is it the voice of them that cry for being overcome, but the noise of 
them that sing do I hear. There's a very important key about this. Sing. Make a note of sing. Because we have to touch on the word sing. All right? Because when we say mesmor, mesmor is not singing like one's called singing. Mesmor is chanting. Most the best comparison would be like Orthodox or the Tawahedo, uh Beta Christian sort of chanting. You understand? Know it's 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 not no musical instrument. The only instrument that's really mentioned is the kabro, is the drum. And when we look at um um Christian or so called church music and religious music today. From a biblical perspective, it is an abomination. You understand? If you say this is this is the kedase, this is the holy music. You can sing, you can sing whatever kind of songs, but here in connection with holy worship, they were singing. You understand? Not chanting. That's the key right here. They were singing, not chanting, and no doubt with um with the instruments of Tubal Cain, of Tubal Cain. Now, here it says, And it came to pass as soon as he came nigh to the camp that he saw the calf and the dancing. They were getting down. They were having a party, right? And Musa's anger waxed hot. Remember, Moses begged, Yah, don't let your anger wax hot. When Moses saw what's going on, and he got to somehow understand what Yah had saw, what Yah saw, and his anger waxed hot, and he cast the tables out of his hand and broke them beneath the mountain. Wow. He broke the law, in a sense. You know, he broke the tables of the law. Some say sympathetic magic, because they broke it, he broke it. You understand? Y'all couldn't have patience. Y'all ain't going to get this. And he took the calf which they had made and burnt it in the fire and ground to powder and strawed upon the water and made the children of Israel drink of it. So he basically ground down, you understand? He, he ground down, you understand, this calf, right? And he made them eat it, basically. He made them eat it, you know. You know, he made them eat their gods. You understand? And Moses said to Aaron, "What did this people to thee? You know, what did this people do to you? You understand? What did this people do to you that thou has brought so great a sin upon them?" This is interesting. Does Aaron have some sort of exemption? In a sense, he over that, is he under some sort of immunity? Did they really do something to him? Did they put pressure? Was it magic? Was it intimidation? But Moses asks this, and notice the context that you, Aaron, has brought so great a sin. You brought a great sin upon the people. Now, when you look up Golden Calf and Aaron in the Bible, it's interesting, after this incident of Aaron and Calf, the only other associations of Aaron and Calf are in Leviticus um, 9 and 2, where it says, And he said to Aaron, Take thee a young calf for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering without blemish and offer them before the Lord. Then in verse 8 it says, Aaron went to the altar and slew the calf of the sin offering, then it says, which for himself or which was for himself. So later, when now the the Levitical order and pattern comes into effect, the calf is a sin offering, and the calf is for Aaron's self, in other words, for his his sin. And Aaron said, let not the anger of my Lord wax hot. Now he's saying, let not the anger of my Lord Adoni wax hot. Thou knowest the people. You know these niggas. You know, you know the people that they are set on mischief or that they on mischief. In other words, you know, like it's set on speed. They are set on mischief. You know, they, they are set on on doing mischief. For they said to me, make us gods, make us Elohim, which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, 
the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we want not what has become of him. Um, we do not know what has happened to him. Now, notice this about this particular um, golden calf image imagery right here. If you look at it, you can see that it has it has carrying, you know, carrying rods, carrying poles right here. That's so why we say this is one of the more accurate from all that we have seen in connection, you understand, with this. You understand, it was no doubt something very much similar to this. So they could, it had a meshekamia, you know, a um, meshekamia, right? Uh, a, a carrier, a palaquin, as it's often called. So he said that they said to him, make us gods which shall go before us, because we don't know what's up with Moses, basically. And I said to them, whosoever hath any gold break, let them break it off. So they gave it me, and I cast it into the fire, and there came out this calf. Now, that's not exactly how it's explained before. You understand? But this is almost like a court. Like, like this, is a, this is like adjudication, in a sense, you know, for Aaron. He's saying he just threw it in there, and boom, it like came out. This particular calf came out. And when Moses saw that the people were naked, remember we said like an orgy? Okay, they got, they was playing, right? They were dancing. They were dancing butt naked, right? This is what was going on. You know what kind of party this was. For Aaron had made them naked. So Aaron had made them naked to their shame among their enemies. Interesting. Could that be what it was meant about the Egyptians would speak? Were, were there a contingent of Egyptians? Could this be a part of a mixed multitude? Were they the Egyptians somehow co-religionists? You know, did they agree with the Hebrew idea? Were they part of like some sort of like were they like in the sense of like the Gentiles are today on that sort of level? Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, "Who is on Yahweh's side? Let him come to me." And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together to him, and he said to them, Thus saith the Lord Yahweh, uh, El Elohe Israel, the God of Israel, put every man his sword by his side, in other words, strap, you know, strap it on, and go in and out from gate to gate throughout the camp, and slay every man his brother, and every man his companion, and every man his Neighbor, isn't this very interesting? This is this is this is very interesting. You, you you know I mean that that now the Levites are going on a wrecking mission, a slaying mission. You know, saying slaying every man his brother, every man his companion, every man his neighbor, and the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and there fell of the people that day about 3,000. Now, when you look in the New Testament, we spoke on this before, it's interesting. On the day of Pentecost, there were saved 3,000, 3,000 souls, the New Testament says. And here, 3,000 perished. You understand? Any connection? Perhaps. For Moses had said, consecrate yourselves today to Yahweh. In other words, make yourself holy. That's that word again, consecrate, caduce. You know what I'm saying? Set yourself aside. You know what I'm saying? To Yahweh. Set aside from all the madness that men and people. In other words, get, your, get yourself right with Jah. Every, even every man upon his son, every man upon his son and upon his brother, that he may bestow upon you a blessing this day. So for for each of you was against a clearer explanation that each of them was against his son. So if his son went astray, went backward in that retrograde, slay. If his brother went backward in that retrograde, slay. You understand? And it's kind of interesting if we read this correctly because it seems to be singling out very interestingly enough um a lot of the men folk, 
It, it, it might also have included woman, too, but that's not what is keenly um, spoken, you know, spoken towards. The son and, and the brother is key indication that the men folk should have known better. So the men folk in the community, we wonder why the men folk be dying or be slayed, so forth and so on. The women are left behind as they are. We can see a sense of it here. So there's a high responsibility, you understand, on the, the wendoch, the males before Yah. You know, to whom um, much is given um, of the same much is required. And it came to pass on the morrow that Musa, Moses, said to the people, Ye, you all, have sinned a great sin, a great hot a great, you've gotten some really bad karma this day. And now I will go up to Yahweh, peradventure, perhaps, peradventure, let's say perhaps, I shall make an, what is that word? An atonement for your sin. I can find some way that you can come back into harmony, you understand, with Yahweh. You can come back in law since you all are outlaws. You understand, you are considered outlaws. And Musa returned to Yahweh and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin and have made them gods of gold. Made them gods of gold. Sounds familiar? When we talk about the golden calf and the bling-bling generation, the end-time bling-bling generation, yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, if you will forgive their, their doing, their bad doing, and if not, blot me. So Moses now, he, he's like going to court. He's, he's arguing on our behalf. And he's arguing even at the stake of his own person. This is why for the Hebrews and, and, and for the, the Jews, the true Jews, you understand, both the racial ones and the converted ones, Moses has such, we have such a high regard for Moses. Because Moses is saying, listen, forgive them. And if not, then blot me out. You know, like, like take me out. You know, get rid of me, I pray you. Out of thy book. Remember the connection we talked about Revelation 5:5 five, five, out of the book. You understand? Obviously, it must be the book, the book of life. You understand? Which thou hast written. So Moses knows that Yahweh has a book written and it has names in there. You understand? Later we will get this idea of the book of life. Now Moses says, "Blot me out. If you can't forgive them, then take me out." And Yahweh said to Moses. Whosoever hath sinned against me. You see, that's where the crime is done. Like I said, black man, Negroes, blacks, and colored, Smith, Jones, and Johnson. We don't have a white man problem, an economic problem, a financial problem, or a woman problem, not even, not even a baby mama drama problem. We have a, a God problem, basically. So John says, Whoever, Whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I what blot out of my book. You understand? That person will he wipe out out of the book. You understand? Therefore now go. You understand? Lead the people to the place of which I have spoken to thee. Behold, mine angel, notice what it says, mine angel, we touched on the angel in the last part, mine angel shall go before thee. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, this idea of visitation, I will visit their sin their wrongdoing upon them. Very, very interesting. And the day that he 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 visits, he's gonna visit their sin, their abyssa, you understand, upon them. And Yahweh plagued the people, right? And Yahweh plagued the people because they made the calf which Aaron made. It, it, it's, it's kind of interesting, right? You notice the language here? <laughs> it's almost and, and not a double speak, but in a sense, a double speak. Who made the calf? Yahweh plagued the people because they made the calf, which Aaron made. You understand? Or would the idea be that um, here's the other um, version of it, and the Lord sent a plague on the people because they had made the calf, the one ca the one Aaron made, which is more or less the same idea. Now, what's the connectivity to this? Well, we have a couple more minutes in this 
presentation. What's the connectivity of this right here? Let's let's touch on uh um get this lined up. All right. Um we're gonna touch on the face. And let's conclude this on the face because it'll give us an opportunity to discuss you know, to discuss these these these, these um horns and, and, and the the frontal image. Right, the frontal the frontal image or the face as it were the face of um the face right here all right now we've we we spoke on this that this is not a naturally occurring thing in nature i mean i mean where would they get the idea to put a or between two horns and to paint it red you know what was in nature not too much in nature the cow is the natural part of it but this orb right here is um not really so much the natural part is a i mean it's not on the earth level it's a heavenly thing so but where would they get this sort of idea except from viewing viewing this particular heavenly sign from the front or the face so the face the panin which is very important the face of god the face of god is the front part right of a person's head or the front of anything such as a clock right a clock face they didn't have clocks back then that we were told but where would they get this image the egyptian ancient egyptian kamite um divinity Kheru or hathor was a rare egyptian character why because she was depicted often full face you understand she was depicted from the front full face usually they preferred profiles in ancient Egyptian um, art. In the tale of the destruction of mankind, her face was depicted as lovely as she passed by. The Egyptian word, um, um, her or her or whore, means face. Her, like haru, H-R, her, her, means face. Compare this to the back parts of God, of Elohim, as he passed by in Exodus 33, 22 to 23. No one was permitted to see Jah's face, although Moses had just spoken to God, according to the book of Moses, his writing face to face. He had a close encounter. You know Is this speaking of different aspects of that which from a holistic Hebrew theology was all of God? You understand the words? So people are, are, are too much anthropomorphizing it and not recognizing that these signs were viewed as manifestations of God and thus God. You understand? Not the God, but are his tools, his signs, his manifestation pointing to him. Now, the Bible, it notes that Moses' face was horned, it was shiny. And it was veiled. And specifically in the Bible, it says Moses' face was horned. All of these descriptions can be interpreted a few different ways. Now, the horn description may mean that something happened to his skin. It was injured some way or became like a horny toad in a sense. This was ugly and may explain why he veiled it, if you, if you think so you know, shapeshifter, transformation. But what about the shiny descriptive? That may mean that he glowed as simply as holy or caduce set apart as he gave off a visible aura, such as the halo of, 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 of the saints. However, the horns may also mean that he wore a horned hat, or perhaps from Egypt and the mysteries, he was of that order. And the horns, they also symbolize how this comet, this planet, Nibiru, Elanin, Planet X, or Ereto, Egusta, how it looked, which was similar to Ahit Haru, or Hathor's headpiece, similar to this sort of headpiece that we have um, right there now, but the veiling. What about the veiling of Moses' face? Is this the writer's clue that the real identity of Moses was somehow hidden? 
Moses in the Bible, in the Hebrew Bible, he did not reveal why, or he, he did not reveal really that he was a king of Egypt, some say. Some say um, Sesostris III, right? The biblical author, in a cryptic way, he called, called Moses humble. Ethiopically, that word humble is tehut. Two men in the Bible are especially called Tehut in the Ethiopic, which connects with Tut. One is Moses, and the other is our Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMoshiach, or Jesus Christ. So the biblical author uses this word, humble. Either Moses himself or an editor who may have known his true identity may have deleted it, Tehut, Musa, or disconnected it. But he left this clue, this key word that must be deciphered Ethiopically, humble. The reason may be that the Exodus Hebrews, Hebrews, forming a new country, wanted to distance themselves from the old or the outcast form of worship that they participated as nationalized Egyptians. But they wanted to keep Moses. Musa was their their Heru, Heru, their hero. How could he be a Hebrew, Heru, if he was an Egyptian or perhaps Ethiopian king? The next part we'll touch on is veiled. So stay tuned, brothers and sisters. More to come, Yah willing. Shalom Rastafari.